Amen, amen, amen. Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, neighbor. if you get the napping, I'm going to get the slapping. Amen. Amen. No? Some of y'all agree with me? Amen. Okay, so since my wife uh, so eloquently told you about my black Mustang, um, yeah, I was friends with my brother in Christ back there, brother Theo back there, and uh, he had a Mustang too. Remember Theo? Yeah. <laughs> Theo had a 5.0. Uh, yeah, and so um, it's, it's amazing because, um, I mean, we used to, you know, when you're young and single, uh, you, you keep your vehicles clean, you know, um, not worried about anybody else's vehicle, just your own vehicle. And so uh, we put that armor all on the tires. And then once we, we look at the weather, amen, amen. That's what we do when we're in the world. We look at the weather and see when it's going to rain and when it's not going to rain. Oh, it's going to be sunny this weekend. I'll clean it. And so you clean your vehicle and stuff like that. Well, well, I tell you this, this is how you know. This is how you know you've met the person you're going to marry. Uh, me and my wife got together. We went to uh, eat. Uh, somewhere we were just friends then and so we went to eat somewhere and uh we were we we had we we laughed all the time it was always funny you know we cracked jokes i'm like oh she's pretty cool she's all right she like my jokes and so um and so uh here's what happened you know we went to this this first this one of the first places in the daytime we went to eat lunch or something like that and uh I just remember, you know, if you were drinking a soda, I was drinking, and you know me, and you, you already know about me and my car. And I was laughing, and she started laughing. And she busts out laughing at something and spit on my dash. Soda. I went from <laughs> true story. And I was like, she must be the one, because I'd have kicked everybody else out of my car. <laughs> and so I, you know, <laughs> she she didn't get it till later, but I was like, man, that was some serious stuff. That's like stealing your money. <laughs> you just put soda on my dash. I'm sorry. Uh, men know about that. Some men know about that. So we understand. And so it's funny because when you see stuff like that, it's uh, you realize, you you know. And so we were listening to the music this morning, and some of us were getting real animated in the music, right? Amen. Can I say amen to that? And so the reason that happens is, well, let me give you a hint of what we used to do. I used to like certain uh, rap music and certain artists from, from way back when. And, you know, and I might tell my age if I tell you, uh, you know, I used to love some LL Cool J, or, you know. And, and on the other end, I like the Commodores. And, and on the other end, I like some Ram Herrera. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, I've met Ram Herrera before. And we, you know, talked and all that and, and uh, um, had a good relationship with them. But. I tell you that because I liked all different types of music. How many people like different types of music? Amen. 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 So, so, so what I'm saying is when you learn the truth that you were created to worship, then you'll realize that you were, I was worshiping the wrong things. I was worshiping all those other songs and those songs didn't get me nothing but debt and disappointment and anger and, and wanting to fight with relation. Am I the only person who's experienced that before? Where you want to fight over some of y'all got that on your mind right now. And I'm telling you, when I learned the true worship, that I was created to worship the one who created me, I let all that other stuff go. And now I get if I can go to an LL Cool J concert or a Commodore's concert or Ram Herrera concert and be all excited, I can be even more excited about the one who created all of them. Amen. And so um and so I, I say that because, you know, I, you may see us jumping around, but I'm jumping around. I'm not worried about anybody else but God. You may see us getting on our knees, but I'm getting on my knees because I got on my knees for everybody else. And so I, I'm not going to give them more than I give God. And so uh, all that music was nothing. It doesn't lead to eternal life. This does. I, I used to play the hardcore rap and some of y'all, maybe the young kids understand the hardcore rap that cursed and called people all kinds of names. I used to play all of that stuff. Bump it real hard. Didn't care who heard the words that were coming out of my, my system. And so if I can do that, I can bump some praise and worship music while I'm driving down the street crying. I don't care. I lift my hands to God because I praise God more than I praise those other people. How many of you said in line before, don't tell the truth, said in line before waiting uh, for a, 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 a music to come out? Well, kids don't do that now. They wait for it to be downloaded. 
But that back then we used to wait in line. Anybody remember Sound Warehouse? Some of you guys used to stand in line be like, it's coming out today. I'm going to be there. Get the first. We gave all honor and glory to those people. Man, that's the, the least we can do is come here and praise God and listen, listen to the, the worship music and give honor and glory to, to him. So I say that because it's important that we gather what we have today. There's, a, there's an importance. And see, well, here's, what, here's the temptation. The temptation that comes this morning is that you'll be tempted to fall asleep. You'll be tempted to, to get up and do something else. You'll be tempted to not listen because the, the enemy that deals with all of us is powerful. And what he wants you to do is ignore what I have to say today. Because if you ignore these words, you had an opportunity, but you didn't take advantage of it. And so I want you to hear this this morning because we have a word for you this morning. And it goes, uh, it's amazing how the worship and my wife and all those words that everybody says goes into the name of the service that we have this morning. The name of service is good merits or a good God. Good merits or a good God. We'll speak from Hebrews 4, Ephesians 2, Romans 3, and James 1. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen, amen, amen. Remember, look at your neighbor this morning. Make sure they're ready also. Last week, last week, look, they're asking me, you, you ready? <laughs> Pastor said I could slap you. <laughs> I thought you fell asleep. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> uh, look. Look, we're aggressive here. It's like, <laughs> just hit them. Just do what you got to do. Last week, we talked about the only thing that prevents a caged lion in the zoo uh, from attacking us. Everybody knows what that is, right? The bars, right? right? Because if you take the bars away, how many of you will still go to the zoo? None of us. <laughs> You'd be like, no, I'm not going to that zoo. That zoo is aggressive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so that's the only thing that keeps the, the lion from attacking us. It's the, the, the bars in between us and the lion. You look at the lion, you're like, oh, look at the lion. Ah, the lion, right? you, you're not worried about that. We know that the lion doesn't have uh, the capacity of converting to a, a great hearted person or animal and wants to become a veg vegetarian and serve the community, right? So you know that that's not what lion, lion's like, oh, no, I'm changed. Trust me, come on in. No, they don't do that. And so none of us would trust that lion. We know that it would attack us if it had the opportunity. Amen. So everybody agrees on that? Anybody love lions? All right. All right. Uh, amen. You love lions? I mean, behind the bars though, right? Amen. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. All right. So everybody knows that it would attack us if, if we, if we, you know, remove the bars. And so we compared that to our lives last week. Uh, we said that uh, the only thing that keeps the average person from committing heinous crimes are the bars or the lawful penalties that are put in place. You don't still in fear that you might get caught and go to jail or uh, you, don't, you don't hurt somebody because you know that if you hurt somebody, you can go to jail. And, and so the average person, potential prison crime does have some weight, right? You know, you can get life for killing somebody. How many people may think about it, but won't do it? You'll think about hurting somebody, but you won't do it. Why? Because you're in fear of the penalty that could uh, be assessed because you did that. And so it does have a weight on your decision making. And so, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we'll say, I think I'll scream at them rather than damage their car. Can I get an amen? Any of you ever damaged car before? Don't tell the truth. Amen. Don't raise your hands. Or, you know, some of you think I'm talking about you, but I'm not talking about you. I'm just I'm, I'm talking about myself. Have I damaged somebody's car before? Yes. <laughs> long time ago. Everybody say a long time ago. Long time ago. Amen. Long, long time ago. And the person's not in here, so I can say it. I can tell you what I did. Making sure they're not in here. No, um, hey man, so you, you say, I'll scream at the person rather than damage their car. Or better yet, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, leave that person rather than hurt that person. Hey man, you don't want to go to jail. You don't want the, the damage that can happen. Uh, the decision making is made because of those bars, because of those fears of the lawful penalties. And so um, your heart may still want to damage that person but fear says no. Amen. So that makes us understand that we all need a savior because we, you know, if you're in your worst circumstances, you still want to do some kind of things. Uh, think about this men that, you know, think about old times. 
You can talk about my car. You may even be able to talk about my girlfriend. But if you talk about my, look, 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 some of y'all remembering, right? You, you can talk, you, you don't talk about my mom. And, and when they call you certain names, you get certain ways. And so, you know, we have to understand that we naturally have hearts that seek after the world. And when people, you know, people lose that fear of those laws is when you see those heinous crimes that happen all around this world. A person no longer fears the consequences. And when they no longer fear the consequences or even death, they go out and do crazy things because they don't have nothing that governs them and tells them that that is wrong. And so it's different for us as believers in Christ. And this is where we're at today. It's different for us uh, because God doesn't judge us based on the bars, the bars, the fears, what you could have done, what you might have done. He judges you based on your heart, the heart, the condition of your heart, what you were thinking about doing. You know, it's not the fact that you didn't hurt that person. You still thought about hurting that person. If you had the opportunity, you would have hurt that person. And so God judges us based on our hearts. That's why we need to listen up this morning to understand what's going on here. Last week, um, we read Hebrews 4 to establish what he does uh, in judging us according to our hearts. And you, 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 you know, because some of us get here and we'll say, I'm a good person. I do, right? I, I take care of people. I do this. I do this. I would help somebody who's, but he's not judging you based on that. He's judging you based on how you think, where your heart is. And Hebrews 4, verse 12 and 13 says this. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. It's not what you did. It's what your intent was. You might have gave a million dollars, but if your intent was for tax purposes, you get what I'm saying? Nothing. It may seem good in this world, but good in God is different. And that's where we're at today. That's what we want to understand. What is good in God? Is that, am I in agreement? Does everybody want to know what is right with God? How can I be made right with God? Because the world will make you think you're the greatest person since life's bread. And so it says nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account to. See, you don't have to answer to your mom when you, when you, when you pass here. You don't have to answer to your boss. You don't even have to answer to maybe the friend that you hurt or did wrong to. You don't have to answer them. You have to answer to God. And it's important for us to tell people about Jesus. Why? Because there are more people out there wanting to hurt other people. And if you don't get to them, they're going to think that what they did is good and they did something good and they take their own life and they're going to wake up right in front of God. And they're going to be held accountable for where their heart was. And it says there's, there's, it's a twinkling of the eye. You're out of the body, present with the Lord, either in agony or in blessings. So people who are lost are lost. And once the governors are taken off of their hearts, once the, those things that hinder them, that, that's not right. Once those things are taken away and all the fear of the laws and all the other fears are gone, all they have is what they're feeling at that moment and they commit acts of evil, amen? But believers are different, and God expects more from us. He doesn't expect you just to be here. Some of you think, I came to church, I did a noble thing. Well, that doesn't get you to heaven. And so I need you to, to, to hear that. And, and we have to ask ourselves as believers one of two things. Do we operate in Christ? Or do we operate in religious practices? See, the world is different. Some of them either accept God or they deny him. 
but we are different in another standpoint because we're supposed to operate in one way or the other. Either you're supposed to know Christ or there are people who think they know Christ but operate in religious practices. And that is deception of the enemy. And I'm, I'm gonna show you some scripture on that. There is a believer, uh, you know, there is a believer who, who claims to know Jesus and there is one who, who knows Jesus. And we're trying to get you to know Jesus, to know why your prayers have not been answered. Has anybody ever asked that question? Why didn't my prayers get answered? Well, God is perfect. If God is perfect, then he answers all prayers. But you've got to ask yourself, are you in Christ or are you just in religion? You can go to church all your life and still not be a believer. You can go to church all your life and wake up and be in front of the, the Lord. And he say, depart from me because I never knew you. You can give all the money in the world, but still not know who Jesus Christ is. And that's the important thing for us to understand. We have to know this. And you know Jesus. You can know him for the first time today by way of your heart being converted, not just your practices, your actions being changed, not just your, your will. Just because you go to church doesn't make you saved because you come here week after week because you sing on a praise team or do something else doesn't make you saved. We want you to know what makes you saved. We want to make you to help you to know what sets you apart, what is called sanctification. And the question you have to ask yourself is, do you want to live by your good merits or by a good God? Your good merits mean I, I've done good. I've given my money. I've, I've gone to the church. Well, the rich young ruler did that. The rich young ruler went to church or, or did all that stuff, gave all his money, did all that. But Jesus said, no, nah, that's not enough. Give up everything you have. Follow me by taking up your cross. And he couldn't do that. So good merits are based on your thoughts and your opinions about what you've done. You can't get before God and say, well, God, I did all kinds of things, man. I mean, I gave half of my money. I did all, I, look, God, I, bought, I paid for this church, that church. I've done all these things. And that doesn't work in heaven. That doesn't work with God. And so good merits are based on your thoughts, based on your opinions, based on what you've done. I should make heaven. I, I believe I shouldn't make it. How many people in here believe they're a good person? All of us probably think, well, I'm good. I take care of my, my, my family. I do this. I do. No, that's not what qualifies you for heaven. And so a good God is based on what you learn about his thoughts and about his truths and about his ways. Look at your neighbor say, it's time to make a change. Time to make a change. We'll begin with Ephesians 2 to get us headed in the right direction. Ephesians 2 verse 8 through 10 says this, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Do you, do you understand that? Everybody understand what it just said? It's by grace that you've been saved. You're not saved by anything else. Well, I've been good. Good doesn't save you. I spent all my money. Money doesn't save you. I go to church. Church doesn't save you. It's by grace, which is unmerited favor, which is unearned, that we have salvation with God. It is, it is, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Know this, uh, you know, that scripture says that you are the handiwork. Look, look, look the handiwork of God. You say, well, well, but I've got problems in my life. It still says you're the handiwork. Of, well, look, uh, I've got issues. I, my relationship is all jacked up. Anybody ever had a jacked up relationship? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I had some jacked up ones. But know this, the scripture says those who believe in Christ are created to do good works. 
even though I might have had some bad relationships, I know that I was created to do good works. And what does it mean for you? It means you came in here with some burdens on your shoulders. Anybody came in here with some burdens? Am I the only one who's had burdens? You know, when my wife talked about anybody had any problems this week? Anybody had any thoughts, uh, uh, you know, uh, going in the wrong direction? And so this is what it says that those who believe in Christ are created to do good works. And so you've got to ask yourself, do you truly believe in Christ? You have to understand the truth that our good works won't save us. God's grace will save us. And when you understand that, the evidence is that we don't boast on anything else but Jesus. <laughs> When you love God, you're not worried about what you did or did not do. You're not worried about who you blessed or who you did not bless. You're not worried about telling everybody else about it. You're worried about giving all honor and glory to God. When we were singing music this morning, nobody was saying, are you getting your praise on? Are you getting your praise on? I hope I'm helping you. No, we're not saying that. We're giving our praise on because we realize it's by the grace of God that we have life. We breathe because of the grace of God. I don't sit there and say, well, when I bow down before God, hopefully somebody's looking as I bow. Nah, not worried about anything else but honor and glory to God. And when you understand that, you understand that the evidence that you know Christ is that you never boast on anything else but Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is the highest praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You got up this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You can breathe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you came in here with problems. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah? Why? Because your problems don't dictate your future. Only God does. We've got to shift. Shift our thinking. You may have come in here with a bag of bricks on your shoulders, but the Lord God Almighty says you are his righteousness. He directed you to church this morning. Hallelujah. We are in the house of God. This is God. He put this, this house together. And we shouldn't be ashamed to praise him. We shouldn't be ashamed to lift our hands to him. We shouldn't be ashamed to sing songs of praise to him. Sometimes because we've been uh, tailored by the world, we come in here and feel all noble. I'm not going to sing. Somebody can hear my voice. No, nah, you don't care when you know Jesus. You don't care how many notes you hit wrong. You just hope the person is praising just like you're praising. How many of you have had some frustration in your life? Do you understand that how mad you are with a coworker, it doesn't condemn or save you at all? Just because you're mad at somebody doesn't make a, it doesn't determine anything in your life. Your good deeds, uh, on the other hand, doesn't uh, matter before a righteous God. You can go to God and say, I did all these things. He's not, he's not interested in all that. He created you. He knows exactly what you've done. How many times you've been to church does not make the difference in whether you're saved or not. There are religious folks who go to church but never knew God. Some of you are political. Your political party or your political side or the side that you favor, it doesn't determine your salvation, nor does it take it away. Some of you are on Instagram. Some of you are on Facebook. Some of you are on all the new stuff. Kids, you know all the new stuff. What you post about your life or about God doesn't matter. You can put God all day on your post, but God looks at your life without the bars. He looks at your hearts. Or you can post something that's not about God. What you're going through doesn't make a difference or doesn't hinder your, your God's judgment on your life. You say, but God, I was going through the worst times. Doesn't matter. He doesn't look at that. The only work that matters 
are the works of God. And you should share that on every page. You know a Christian because all they talk about is God. You know a Christian because all they post are the things about Jesus. Why? Because that's all they're interested in. Why? Because they know that they're saved by grace. They know it's unearned. They know they can do nothing to pay God back. They know they can do nothing to make themselves more righteous than what God has already done. They know that when Jesus died on the cross, he was thinking about every one of us. And so all they can do is think about him. When they wake up, they say, thank you, God, for waking me up. When they're in the worst circumstances, they say, thank you, God, for a way out. When they're going through a, a loss of a limb or a problem or, or a health issue, they say, God, I give you all honor and glory. You must have somebody at the hospital I want to talk to. They let them their circumstances be a catapult to doing the work of God. When you understand that, I want you to write this down. God's grace outweighs our challenges. God's grace outweighs our challenges. And here's the problem. When we take our eyes off of the grace that God has given us, the mercy he's given us, we seem to think our situations are bigger than our God. Has anybody ever been there? Where you think your situation is so overwhelming that well, where's God at? Why is he not hearing me? That's just not true. None of our situations are bigger than our God. All of us have come in here a time or two with heavy burdens on our shoulders. I know I have. But I'm here to tell you that God's grace is greater than our burdens. What you're experiencing, what you've been through, what you're dealing with is not as big as the God you serve. He's given you eternal life. This life is this small. Eternal life is everything. So, well, then we ask ourselves this question. What is true? I mean, because you can go to any church. But you got to know what's true. What is true? And I want you to leave here with something this, this morning. I want you to leave here with what is true. I don't want you to come here, you know, go out there and say, well, man, they had a great praise and worship team, but I don't know what the service is about. I want you to leave and say, I know what's true, and I'm going to make a decision to either follow or deny. Does everybody want to know what's true? Amen. Say amen if you want to know what's true. It's true that nothing we do can bring us closer to God. Do you hear me? Your good works doesn't bring you closer to God. Because you help somebody doesn't bring you, because you come to church, it doesn't bring you closer to God. And I want you to know that because you can understand it's not by your efforts, it's by the grace of God that you have access to them. But I need you to understand what it takes to become closer to God. And I'm gonna show you in scripture. God operates by what we call righteous. He operates by righteousness. He operates by what is righteous and what is not righteous. Righteous is only through him. Unrighteous is through everything else. So it's cut and dry with God. He knows what's righteous because it's him. And he knows what's unrighteous because it's everything but him. All right, so that's simple. So let's continue with this. What is righteous will get you as close as you want to get to God. All right, we can go home after that. You learn what is righteous and you learn what is not righteous. What is righteous will get you close to God. What is unrighteous will not. So it is our job to learn these things and not be biased based on our beliefs, but be unbiased and learn what God has to say for you uh, based on his truth. Now, the, the Jews in the Roman Catholic Church, they thought that they were righteous. They thought that because they came to church, because they did things, because they had the phylacteries and were dressed well and had everything on and had the high seats and all that other stuff, they had the gold and, and all the decorated sanctuaries. They thought that because they had all of that stuff, they were righteous. 
But Paul answered that for them. Paul writes to them, and this will help us today so that we'll know that nothing we do makes us righteous. Romans 3, verse 20 and 22, through 22. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Let me give you an example of the works of the law. He says, do not steal. How many of us have not stolen before? How many of us have stolen something before? Everybody raise their hand. How many of us have lied before? Look, I them hands went up too quick about lies. <laughs> it was like, kids were like, yes! Oh, I'm sorry. No, that didn't get you to heaven. I'm just want to let you know. That. <laughs> How many of us have lied before? Tell the truth. I love these kids. They tell the truth. How many of us have not lied before? All right. Okay, so righteous in God's sight is, is not, you know, there were no one who would be declared, declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So it doesn't matter what the law says. The law tells you all kinds of things of not to do and what to do and what not to do and where to go. And, you know, it tells you all those things. And then it says, rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin, conscience of sin, conscious of sin. And so you know it's wrong to steal, right? How many people know it's wrong to steal? Everybody. How many of you know it's wrong to lie? And it's not because you've told a lie before. It's not because you've stolen something before, but because your heart just knows that it's not right to take something that's not yours, right? That's what the law is. And God writes it on our hearts. He tells, how many people know that it's right to destroy cancer, right? If cancer is on somebody's body, you know it's right to destroy cancer, right? Everybody agree on that? But how many of you know it's wrong to destroy a baby? Everybody. You know it's right to kill cancer, but it's not right to kill a baby. Why do you know that? Because that's God's goodness that's allowing you to see his righteousness. So what it's saying here, there will no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. It doesn't matter that you know all of that. It doesn't make you righteous. In layman's term, God tells us things to do and things not to do in his commandments. He tells us not to lie. He tells us not to steal. But all of us have been guilty of one of those sins. So because we're made aware of it, because we know not to steal, because we know uh, not to not to be angry. Those things don't make us righteous because we don't do it because you say, I'm not going to steal anymore. The fact that you stole before makes you unrighteous. I'm not going to lie anymore, mom. I promise. Any kids ever said that? I didn't eat the cookies. You got crumbs on your mouth. I promise. <laughs> I'm thinking about a video I saw where the kid was like, no, I don't know who took it. He had it all on his face. I'm sorry. But anyways, uh, and so the, the problem is not the laws. The problem is that we've already violated all of them. And because we've broken the commandments, because we do right things, it doesn't make us righteous because only God is righteous. God can't take back what we've already done. He, you say, I haven't stole. I, I stopped stealing after certain you like, but you stole before. I stopped lying, but you lied before. I honored my mom, but you didn't honor him at first. I, I stopped that anger. I went to anger management, but before the anger management, you had anger. Now the apostle Paul goes to give us further understanding of what makes us righteous. Now, this is the part we want to learn this morning. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The right, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Look, going to church may make you feel right, but as we said before, our feelings do not carry that weight, uh, that burden, I mean, that burden away from us before a righteous God. Because you come here, it doesn't make you righteous. However, our heart's condition does. Some of the Jews at that time, they followed the laws to a T. They also worshiped uh, in the synagogue. That's why Paul made it clear that the law only exposed what you have already violated. The law simply lets you know what you've already done wrong. The law simply exposes what you've already messed up. You can't fix the glass that's broken already. All right. 
The other thing to understand is even though you may have stopped violating the laws, it doesn't bring you closer to God. So because we attend service doesn't make us closer to God. Faith in Jesus Christ makes you saved and doing his will makes you closer to God. Does everybody understand what I just said? Faith in Jesus Christ makes you saved and it also brings you closer to God. Meaning you can do all you want, but if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ and if you don't have faith in what he's done and if you don't have faith that it's by his works that you have been saved, then you don't have salvation. You can't get closer to some people say, well, I wonder why God hasn't answered my my questions. I wonder why God hasn't showed up. When, you know, has anybody ever seen that person who's holier than thou? Looks like they walk on water and glow in the dark. Like they're so Jesus. Is Jesus free? Some of y'all looking up and saying, that's you. <laughs> Amen. You know, the person's always doing things that are that are that are they're happy and all, but that doesn't make them saved. And what you got to understand is you, this may be your first time here. You may be coming here for the first, second, third. It doesn't matter how many times you do. But the fact is, the only thing that makes you saved is your faith in Jesus and then applying his works to your lives. That's it. And so when you try to apply your own works, this is where you get the burdens in your lives. So because we attend service, it doesn't make us closer to God. Faith in Jesus makes you closer to God. Because we do good works doesn't make us closer. Faith in the good works through Christ makes you closer to God. The point is, some of us finally realize we're doing it all wrong. We thought that it was by our efforts. We thought that it was by our works. Instead of understanding the grace of God. When you understand the grace of God, you take all of your things, you put it through that shredder, and you allow the grace of God to be the first and the last in everything that you do. Some people say, I've been wondering, newsflash, just because you're going to church doesn't make you righteous. Just because you do things right doesn't make you righteous. People say, well, that's why I feel separated. That's why I felt that. I was wondering why that holier than thou person seem like they're always in God, but I can't see them. I can't find them. Well, God makes himself evident to all who want to find him, which means that you've been looking in the wrong place. You've been looking off of your efforts instead of looking off the efforts of Christ. That's why I felt disconnected. That's why I felt that God doesn't love me. Has anybody ever been there? That's why I've been looking for love in, in all the wrong places. <laughs> because you've been looking for God with your actions, but not because of his actions. If you search for God, you'll find him. But if you search for religion, you'll find it. Those people that Paul was talking to, there were people who went to church time and time again, but they brought their religious ways. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, those people brought their religious ways. And Jesus was right in front of them, healing people when they were trying to find ways to, to condemn him. But he was right in front of them. Why didn't they see him? Because they were too religious. Instead of having a relationship with God. Your actions do not make God save you. His action shows you his grace. So the reason I'm excited is not because I praised all those wrong songs, but because he allowed me to see that it was by his grace that I have been saved. And I don't think that my praising gets me closer to him. I think I know that I'm closer to him by his grace because he saved me and set me apart. And so I understand that. That's why I praise and I worship him. Not because it brings me closer, but because it lets me know that he's already with me. So some people. Some people when we, you know, when we learn, we learn that praising God is not because we're looking for that nice feeling. 
And when you look for that nice spirit, I'm going to this church because, oh man, I felt the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit was with you when you came and when you leave. But if you didn't have him when you came, then you're not going to have him when you leave if you're basing it on a feeling. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is a presence. So I'm, Pastor, I'm looking for God. Well, he's right beside you. Look in front of you. I don't know where he's at. I've been having these hard feelings. It's because you've been giving into the feelings and not to God. I'm stressed. I'm, you know, we all stress. I'm depressed. We've all had the temptation of depression. God, I don't know what to do. We've all said that. But when you understand the movement of the Holy Spirit, you understand that once you believe what we're talking about today, once you believe that it was off the efforts of Jesus that you have salvation, once you understand that it's by his works, then you know that that Holy Spirit never leaves you. And when you understand the realization of what Jesus has done, you ask yourself this question. How do we become more faithful to the things of Christ? Going to church doesn't do that. It doesn't make you closer, but it is a good start. How many of you are wanting to wanting a change in your heart, wanting a change in your lives? Well, let's hear what James says. The apostle in the book of James 1, verse uh, 22 and 25. This is what he tells us. Because some of you want change. Anybody want change? Raise your hand if you want change. Amen. Raise a hand if you want different. If you want to get those hard feelings out of your heart, you want to get that feeling of deception, that anger, that frustration, that doubt, that disbelief. How many people want this to raise your hands to the Lord this morning? Amen. This is what it says. Do not merely listen to the word, which you did today, and so deceive yourselves. If you just listen to what I said, and you go away and think you're good and think everything's working perfectly and don't understand and don't apply anything, useless. It says, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <laughs> and anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looked like. Mm. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Hey, Amen. That's simple stuff. Coming to service today is not enough. It's just the beginning. Some people think that's the means to the end because you came to church. You're righteous. You're operating right. God loves you. No, God loved you before you came to church. This is just the beginning of your walk with Christ. You can just be a hearer of the word, but if you're not a doer of the word, what does it say? It says you're wasting your time. The apostle James says that anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, or, uh, you know, they, know, they look in the mirror and don't even know what they look like. Any, anybody ever done that? You look in the mirror, he's like, what? Who was that? Okay. Let me look at, oh. And it, that's what it's saying. It's saying you look in the mirror, but then you walk away and don't see what you look like. I'm overwhelmed. I'm so confused. I'm so consumed. I'm so depressed. Those are the things that draw us to church. But the problem is those are the same things that draw us away from church. I'm so depressed. I'm, I have anxiety. It's, I'll never get out of this. I don't know what to do. God, where are you? Anybody ever said that? Amen. I know I have that oh man, a thousand times. These, those things that I just said, those things are the products of looking into the mirror, the mirror of God, but not knowing what you look like because you turned away from God. How can you know what you look like if you keep turning away from God? But I go to church. Going to church doesn't make you face God. Knowing who God is, knowing what Jesus did is what makes you face God. And the problem that we have sometimes as Christians is sometimes you may go to church, but church doesn't go with you. You say, God, I love you, but then you still curse somebody out. 
We just talked about cursing today. And you get out of here and you say things because you thought I would be the person who you had to be respectful around, not knowing that once you accepted Christ, Jesus came into your heart by way of the Holy Spirit, which means that every word that proceeds out of your mouth, he hears. And it's a simple statement that we have to make. If you want to change, let's change. How many people want to change in here? Give a round of applause if you want to change in your heart. You don't want to be consumed anymore. You don't want anxiety. You don't want to deal with depression. You don't want that frustration. You want something that overcomes that. The scripture made it clear that the righteousness is through Christ. We are made righteous through Christ. And we access that closeness to God through Christ. Not on your own, but through Christ. You can't get close to God coming to church. You can get close to God coming to church and understanding what God has done for you. In James, the first five, uh, I mean, the first chapter, verses five through eight, James makes it clear. He clears it up for all of us. This is what he says in James, the first chapter, verse five through eight. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God. Wow. Who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double minded and unstable in all they do. I guarantee you that people who come to church just because it's church, but don't seek Jesus are unstable and double minded. They say, I love you, God, when things are going bad. I'll go to church, but church won't go with me. I love you, God. Uh, I won't curse in church, but I'll curse out there in the streets. I love you, God, but uh, I won't be angry in church, but I'll be angry with my children. I'll be angry with my husband. I'll be angry with my wife. I'll be angry with my job because they're doing me wrong. We have all been double-minded at one time or another in our lives, but you don't have to remain there. And the problem is the devil who's listening to this conversation, the devil who's hearing what we're saying this morning, the devil who's waiting outside those doors for you to come out, the devil who wants you to get in your car and say bad things and curse somebody out and go with that frustration, the devil who is evident in everything, he'll be with you when you go to sleep, he'll be with you when you wake up. The devil hears these words. And what he wants to do is make you comfortable with the old and not let go of the old. And if you walk out here with, uh, walk out of here with the frustration, with the fear, with the doubt, with the anger and all that bitterness towards other people, you've seen the mirror, but you've forgotten what you look like. I was reading a commentary on, on on what we're reading here on James, the first chapter. And this is what he said. It's so powerful. This is what it said. God can build our character with our cooperation. Cooperation. If we resist him, then he chastens us into submission. <laughs> but if we submit to him, then he can accomplish his work. He is not satisfied with a halfway job. God wants a perfect work. He wants a finished product that is mature and complete. Mm. What does that mean? This is not enough. Because you do this, this is not enough. The problems we have are not because of God. They're self-inflicted. We say, God, help us. But then we go drink. But then we go smoke. But then we go party. But then we go do all. Then we say, God, please help me out of jail. I didn't put you in jail. Your actions put you in jail. God, please take care of my parents. I didn't put them in those circumstances. Their actions put them in the circumstances. Who in here wants results? Do you want results? Did you come here to, to have a great service or do you want results when you leave here? If you want results, say, I want results. I want results. Amen. Understand this, that God can do all things but fail. 
Do you hear me? He can do all things but fail. He's perfect in everything he does. And he promises to you the same things he promises to me. If I have favor, guess what? You can do. If I'm blessed, guess what? You can be blessed too. But you can't be blessed doing the old and expecting the new. If you are unstable and do not know what you look like, it's not because of God. Say, God, I, I don't know. I've been going to church. What going to church and make you stable? Listening to God makes you stable. It's because of self-inflicted wounds. And the last thing I remember reading in James chapter one, verse 25, is it says, but whoever intently look, I mean, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Knowing God does a true movement on your heart. Not just knowing about God, but knowing God. People cried today because they know God. Uh, uh, look, I came in here with my bag because I got some problems. I got some debt issues. I got some children issues. I got some financial issues. I got some relationship issues, but you know God. Amen. The question is not how stable you are uh, in this world. It's how stable you are in Christ. And God promises that what he gives me, he gives you also. So if you're unstable and you're dealing with crisis, it's not because of God. We have to understand what true salvation is, which is by works. I mean, I'm sorry, not by your works. It's by God's works. It's through your faith in Christ. Knowing God will do a true movement in your hearts. True prosperity is not achieved by your works. It's achieved by your faith in Christ. You want to know God more? Increase your faith in Christ. You want to know how to be more stable? Increase your faith in Christ. Stability is not a good job with a lot of money. Stability is in Christ. Your identity is not determined by going to church. It's determined by your faith work in Christ. So I go to church, I've been going to church for 20 years. But do you have faith in Christ? Your healing is not determined by your prayers. How many people think it's determined by your prayer? It's not. It's determined by your faith in Christ, your faithful prayers in Christ. You can say all the scriptures in the world, but if you don't know Christ, coming into this building only helps you if you want to be helped. And you got to ask yourself, do you want to trust in your unstable good merits or a good God? That begins with your faith in Christ. God removes all the bars and he looks at our hearts. And if he doesn't see anything but Christ, guess what? You'll be blessed. When, when you remove all those things, that anger, the bitterness, that's only a work of God by way of the Holy Spirit. When you understand that, you allow him to be the first in your life. You don't want religious ways because religious ways doesn't save you. You want a relationship just because you go to church. It doesn't make you say you want a relationship just because you get up here and praise. You want a relationship just because you sing. You want a relationship just because you drove here. That's not what does it. You want a relationship with God. And that begins and ends with Jesus. And if you don't do that, if you wonder, well, I can't, I can't do this Christian thing. I can't, well, it's not God because he promises you the same thing. You didn't want it, so you didn't get it. But if you want it, he says, seek ye first my kingdom. If you want change today, you have to first understand that you can be saved by the grace of God. By accepting that Jesus Christ is the way of making you stable. A good job doesn't make you stable. A good job may make you content. A good job may, 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 may make you financially uh, secure. But stability only comes through Jesus. 
You don't want good merits. You want a good God. You don't want to get before God and say, I did this. You want to get before God and say, I'm glad you did this. And so I want to do this last thing. I want to pray for you. I want those of you, I want everybody to stand to their feet if they can. Does anybody want a change in their lives? Is anybody, is anybody tired of doing it the religious way? Does anybody want a true change of heart made by the Holy Spirit? Well, this is what I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, make me a new creation. Let the old things pass away and let all things become new. I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins and sit at the right hand of the Father. I believe that I am saved by grace, by your works alone. I believe that you are worthy and make me a new creation. Let the old thing pass away and let all things become new. I promise to serve you and focus on you for it is in your name, Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen.